This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On May 17th, the RCMI, in partnership with the Pillar Society, held a speaker's luncheon featuring Dr. Eric Jardine, Senior Research Fellow of the Centre for International Governance Innovation at the University of Waterloo. Dr. Jardine spoke to the topic of the dark web. First, I would just like to uh, thank Chris and the Royal Canadian Military Institute for having me, Pillar Society for reaching out and connecting with me in the first place. Uh, this is quite a treat for me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time. It's a beautiful building. Secondly, with regards to the publications here, we are handing them out. They're not all from me. That would be really self-serving. <laughs> this is all my stuff. Look at how amazing I am. There's uh, one paper in there that's written by the former uh, Homeland Security Secretary, Michael Chertoff, and another paper written by two computer scientists in the UK who did a great job of mapping out parts of the dark web, and I'll be talking about their research to here today. So if it is, you are interested, there is some reading material for afterwards. So, the main aim is sort of zoomed out and looked at the presentation from sort of 10,000 feet is really to get at this idea of what role does the dark web play in the occurrence of crime today. And if you had to take away from that a single point, it's that more and more the dark web is being used in the arsenal of criminals of various stripes. I'll get through in some detail the different types of uses, but that would be the main point, that more and more people are turning to it because it is an effective tool. It amplifies capabilities and reduces transaction costs. But there is a caveat to all of that, and that is that you can't just turn from that conclusion that it's being used by criminals and say, shut it down. Public opinion may be of that mind, but there's both technological and moral reasons why it doesn't really work out in, uh, to shut the network down. And I'll get through, go through both of those in some detail as well. But all is not lost. Criminals are using it, but there are ways to effectively police the network. I'll go through some of the effective strategies that have been undertaken by law enforcement around the world. Uh, this is the list that I'll go through is by no means exhaustive, but it will give you a sense of the fact that despite the technological trickery used to produce anonymity, the system is not perfect. Humans are involved, and so the system is fallible, and you can catch criminals even if they are lurking in the dark recesses of the dark web. So by way of an overview, I really structured the entire presentation around four questions. Because it's so, uh, the technology is new to most people, I like to start at a very basic level. So what is the dark web and how does it work? From there, I like to talk about what makes up the dark web, what kind of sites are we dealing with on the dark web. Following that, patterns of traffic, so sort of the idea that you know, you might have 100 sites dedicated towards hockey, but most of that, the, the, the traffic actually goes to only one of those sites. And the other 99 are actually not that well uh, trafficked at all. And finally, I'll talk about what should be done. So, the dark web is easiest to grasp if you actually think about it relative to what is known as the surface web. And the surface web is the part of the internet that we all use every single day. So this surface web is essentially everything that's publicly indexed by Google, by uh, Safari, or, or uh, uh, by uh, Edge, or, or by Internet Explorer. And it's everything that's public accessible. So it'd be blogs, it'd be the CBC News site, it'd be some, uh, it'd be the RCMI web page, and things like that. The, the surface web is quite large, there's billions of websites out there. But it's dwarfed when compared to the deep web. The deep web has a single defining characteristic, really, and that is everything on the deep web is held behind login credentials. It could be a paywall, so things like the New York Times articles or things like academic journals are part of the deep web because they're not readily indexed and they're not uh, readily accessible by just using Chrome. They could also be held behind uh, 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 corporate login credentials where you basically can give it a fob with a rotating key and then you can log into a network. So, the deep web is about 500 times larger than the surface web, but not all of the content on the deep web is necessarily malicious. And so you hear in the media a lot the idea that the deep web and the dark web are the same. They're not. The deep web is huge, much bigger than the surface web, but it's not all that bad. But below that, you have another layer. 
And that layer is the dark web. And I'll get the dark web's defining characteristic is really that everything done there is done anonymously. This means that you can host content anonymously, you can set up websites, you can post things to websites, and you can surf the web anonymously. And the dark web, when you actually strip away the deep web and all the components that are actually just databases of information, is actually really quite small. So the dark web has about 30,000 to maybe 60,000 websites at any given time. One study did a six month average and found about 45,000. And so we're dealing with a problem, to be sure, and it's growing in size, there's more sites every day, but it's still tiny and minuscule compared to the other parts of the internet. So some of the hype surrounding this, the, the mystique of the dark web is actually just the result of a confusion of terms. And as I said, the dark web's the characteristic, its main characteristic is anonymity. Now that anonymity means that you can't get there using a normal internet connection. So back in the early 1990s, the New Yorker, they ran a cartoon that had one dog sitting at a computer looking over at another dog, and the caption said, on the internet nobody knows you're a dog. And that might well have been true in the early 1990s because the technology wasn't quite there to really pinpoint what device was communicating which, which server or which, or which website. And all that has changed. And so now you have a more updated cartoon where you basically have taken advantage of the revelations that Edward Snowden uh, disclosed about uh, NSA surveillance. This captioned our metadata analysis, and metadata being simply records of who is communicating with whom for how long and, and that sort of thing. Our metadata analysis indicates that he is definitely a brown lab. He lives with a white spotted like beagle mix, and they, I suspect they are humble. <laughs> and really, it just goes to illustrate the point that a typical internet connection does not produce anonymity. And the reason it doesn't is because direct, it's, the typical connection is a direct one. So sitting at home or on your mobile device or at work, you open up a browser, you type in something in the search window, you hit return, and then your internet service provider sends that signal to where it needs to go, and the, the information that you're looking for is returned to you directly. It's very easy then for the website operators to make a record of what you're visiting, how long you look at it, that's how they can sort of construct targeted advertising. It's easy for Google to keep a record of everything that you're searching for, that's how they, again, do targeted advertising. Uh -oh. Mayday. Yeah. So I'm not going to touch any of the wires. Loose. So that and so that's also how your internet service provider, because of that direct connection, your internet service provider is able to uh, provide to law enforcement on receipt of a legal of a warrant, detailed records, often ranging back months, often around six months, uh, the, everything you visited while online. And so. Since the typical internet connection is direct and does not provide anonymity, you cannot use it for technological reasons and conceptual reasons to reach the dark web. And so there is an alternative, and that alternative, one of the alternatives, but it is the most well-trafficked, is known as the Tor browser. And so Tor is a system that allows you to search the internet, both the surface web and the dark web, but to do so anonymously. It also allows you to host content and post websites. And so you can do the full range of functions that you can on the, surf, on the normal web with a normal connection, but you do it anonymously. And as you can see from this screenshot from the actual Tor browser, it's all just oriented around a central search bar. So it's very intuitive to use. It takes about three clicks to download. And the way in which the Tor browser produces anonymity is that it basically takes your typical internet connection and it breaks it up. I like to sort of liken it a little bit to a, the children's game of telephone. So that rather than having Alice, who needs to get some information from Bob in this example, rather than having her confer directly with Bob, she first sends her request via an encrypted signal to a computer in the Tor network. That computer sends it on to the next computer, on to the next computer, which then asks for the material from Bob, and it is returned by a series of three relays. Now these relays are all volunteer computers. Any one of us, if we wanted to, could volunteer our computer into the Tor network. It would then become a relay in the system. If we were uh, very risk accepting, we could volunteer to be an end node, which is the one communicating with Bob, because that one is visible to uh, ISPs and to law enforcement. But because you have uh, thousands of computers all over the world volunteered into this network, and the signal gets constantly broken up and shuffled around, it's really difficult to pinpoint 
out, or to draw a correlation between Alice and what she's viewing. So if you compromise the first computer in this system, you could potentially say this is who initiated this request. You might, but you won't know what the content is because you can't, unless you break the encryption, you won't know what the content is because you can't see what the actual request was. If you were in the last, uh, if you were in the last computer's position, you'd be able to say this is what they're viewing, but I have no idea who's trying to view it. You just simply, so it produces anonymity by breaking up the signal. And so, as I'll get into, that anonymity is both good and bad, but it, that, that's the basic process of how it works. So, in Canada, as elsewhere, uh, I'll start well, I'll start global. Tor overall has about 2.5 million users a day. Canada and its growth in, has seen a large growth in Tor usage. From 2011, when it's about 1.5 million users per year, uh, to over 15 million users per year in 2015. Now, the one thing to, to sort of contextualize these results somewhat is that this doesn't mean 15 million unique users, it means 15 million uses of the network. So it could be one person 15 million times, and, or it could be 15 million people once. Just so that we know we don't think that half the population is all of a sudden jumping on top. That's not what we're dealing with. But the point is that you have a tenfold growth in usage over this period, and a lot of it, both in Canada and globally, is actually attributable to the, uh, the aftermath of Edward Snowden and his disclosures. And you see a, a statistically significant increase, in fact, in Tor network usage in the months following the, uh, disclo the disclosures in 2013. And that causes problems because when you increase the number of users of the system, it actually increases the anonymity that the system produces, making the job of normal law enforcement harder, even while the NSA was trying to keep them safe at the same time. So there's a bit of a, uh, a paradox there to some extent. So if we delve down now and look at some of the specific things that the Tor can be used for, the dark web can be used for, I want to start on the good side. And the reason I do that is because it's important to bear in mind, especially as we run through the litany of abuses that can be done with a system that produces anonymity and allows people to do whatever they want online, to recognize that there are certain situation, situations where that anonymity can be the last line of defense between yourself and a very repressive regime. And so this screenshot is not Facebook from Google or Facebook from Safari. This is Facebook as it is hosted on the dark web, on the Tor dark web. This is a dark web website. You can tell because the dot onion suffix. Whoa. You can tell because the dot onion suffix at the end of the uh, uh, of the address line instead of dot com, which would normally be. And Tor now receives on the dark web upwards of one million users per month, and that number continues to increase. And they basically have set up the website as a way for people in repressive regimes to gain access to social media, to try to gain access to information, and to circumvent censorship and surveillance measures that are undertaken by regimes in China, across the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere. So bear that in mind, that there is legitimate positive uses for this in some contexts. That being said, there are also a series of negative uses that I will get to now. So the first I like to think of as an issue of the dark web finding a way to bridge the gap between someone having the motive to do something and the ability to do so. That's always been a gap that's prevented crime in the past, and one of the things that the dark web is doing is actually narrowing it significantly. So this, is like this dark web website, which again, it's a screenshot I took from an actual dark web website with the contact information obviously redacted, um, it's a list of services for sale by a hitman. I don't know whether this site was actually valid or not, but it goes to illustrate the point, because there are hundreds of these out there, where they're basically selling services ranging from murder, crippling, rape, bombing, or beatings at a specific monetary price. The one that I find uh, most troubling, for obvious reasons, but that really goes to show the sort of range of things that you can now purchase on these sort of sites is this one here. That the going rate to have an underage family member raped is apparently $36,000. Again, I don't know if this site was actually operational, whether it was run by law enforcement or what have you, but this is one among many. There are thousands of sites or hundreds of sites like this out there. And so if someone wants to do something nasty, and they're not gonna do it themselves, but they have the money to do it, they can now find a way to do this. There's also Hacker for Hire sites that are along a similar vein. And this is where you run into a, a different sort of problem where you have, for example, groups like ISIS attempting to hack the US power grid, 
but doing badly because they're not very good at it. And the, the nightmare scenario for everyone in the US administration is that they're going to find the, the skills on a dark web market just like this one, because there are hackers who are higher code than me. So that's one problem that the dark web is, is, is raising, is that there's a number of instances where people with malicious intent can now easily get paired with people with malicious ability. The dark web is also uh, seen a proliferation of illegal marketplaces. Silk Road is probably the most famous of these. It started in 2011 and uh, was taken down by a joint operation run by Homeland Security and the FBI in 2013. The operation was called Marco Polo, which I guess fits with the name of the website. Uh, typically, these, these sort of markets tend to be dominated in large measure by drugs. So a study of Silk Road, what was for sale on Silk Road found that 10 out of the, uh, sorry, 90% of the top 10 categories were all drug related, and 80% of the top 20, again, were all drug related. Silk Road made billions in revenue and earned the main site administrator, who went by the moniker Dread Pirate Roberts, like from The Princess Bride, uh, made him uh, millions of dollars a year. He was eventually arrested, and I'll get to how exactly they managed to break up uh, the Silk Road websites a bit later on, but it goes to show that you can find very, it's very easy to reduce, that the dark web tends to reduce transaction costs. And so now you have, for example, there's a story in the media right now of a, of a I think a high school age student in the UK who bought heroin on, the dark, on a dark web website, just like this one, and ended up having it shipped to his house, took it and OD'd. And so it's again, just the transaction costs for what would otherwise deter people from trying to do something like that, like having to go to a bad neighborhood, risk running the police, risk physical violence, all these sort of things, they're all eliminated. It's very simple to click of a button and you have drugs coming directly to your door. Another use for the dark web is that's emerging is as a, a, a form of bag drop or money drop or ransom drop site. So there's always been kidnappings, there's always been ransoms, but the, the, for law enforcement, the time at which you had the highest probability of catching the criminals was when you had to exchange the money. Somebody had to show up to pick that up. And that's changed. So this is actually a digital version of the entire kidnapping scenario, where you have what is known as ransomware malware. It goes by CryptoLocker, CryptoWall, a variety of different other names for it. But what it basically does is someone will infect their own computer by opening a link on an email or something like that. And the, the, the malware will essentially encrypt their system, locking the user out of all of their applications and all of their programs and all of their data. It'll, you'll then get a pop-up screen similar to this one where you'll essentially say your system was encrypted at this date, this, the keys for this particular encryption expire at this date. And down here, in the highlighted portion, you'll basically say the price that we're charging is this number of bitcoins, which is an anonymous currency that you can even use to uh, make transactions, and you have to pay it at this address, which will be a dot onion Tor hosted dark web website address. And then, so basically, you'll go there, it'll be sort of like visiting a PayPal site or the equivalent, and you basically make the exchange of bitcoin, and they'll give you the ransom keys or the, the encryption keys, and you can unlock your system. Obviously, all of the uh, power is in the hands of the people holding the encryption keys, but I think probably because criminals recognize that this system is paying off pretty well for them, you actually see a great number of instances where they do, almost in every instance in fact, provide the keys to the person who's locked out of their system. So there's a great example from um, Dixon, Tennessee, where the sheriff's department was actually locked out of their system, 70,000 files, and they called in the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, they called in the FBI. None of those organizations were able to crack the encryption. So they basically, once they determined that part of those 70,000 files were pertinent to ongoing criminal investigations, they actually paid the five, oddly specific $572 to the criminals, who then provided them with the keys and they unlocked their system. So even in the most antagonistic sort of situation you can think of, where the criminals have locked out law enforcement, they still oddly for thieves, were honorable and paid, or provided the keys when paid the money. And I think it's a general sort of ethos or norm among the criminals themselves where they realize because they're not stealing anything, there's no way to monetize this unless people pay. And the second the word gets out that people won't pay, the whole thing just becomes a giant waste of everybody's time. But because of its effectiveness, you've seen a pretty astronomical growth 
in just one year's time, you had a 4,400% increase of the use of crypto lockers and ransomware that jumped from 8,274 8, instances as recorded by Morgan Semantic in, in uh, 2013 to 373,342 instances in 2014. So success tends to breed success, and you have this weird issue where the dark web is acting as a surrogate for what used to be a weak point in uh, the criminal activity of, of ransomers and hostage takers. And finally, you have what some consider to be one of the worst forms of cyber attacks, although that's debatable in some ways. You have uh, the, the dark web playing host for what are known as botnet command and control servers. And so I'll take a step back and just sort of explain all the ins and outs of that, just assuming most people aren't familiar with what happens here. Basically, botnets are a series of computers. It could be your phone, it could be your mobile device, it could be your laptop, it could increasingly be your fridge, your car, your printers, anything with an internet connection and a bit of RAM can be infected with malware, and then it becomes a slave to a botnet control, uh, command and control mode. These botnets tend to be massive, they're ranging well into the millions on some occasions, and basically the owner will, not, will usually not know that their system's actually been infected. And the reason that they don't know is because all that the botnet does is basically use a part of its RAM uh, and processing power to undertake an attack. Not enough to really shut the whole thing down, the, the point is not to target your computer, the point is to target a different computer. Often public facing websites or banks get targeted all the time government websites, which again get targeted all the time. And, but really anyone with a public facing website can be targeted. And these are problematic for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that emergency services and the like can certainly be targeted in times of crisis, basically knocking offline any potential recourse you could have via the internet. And so as the picture kind of graphically shows, you have an attacker on the laptop looking like an alien, apparently, I didn't make this one, but that's sort of what it looks like. Then they'll log into their command and control node, which will be hosted on the dark web. That control node will, will correspond with the millions of computers that are uh, that have, are infected with the malware and that are essentially a slave to the commands of the attacker. And then they'll just bombard the victim with requests to view the website. So every website can only handle a finite number of requests. And if you go over that, you basically knock it offline or degrade the service. So it's like in a disaster movie when the protagonist tries to call loved ones and all they get is the, the line, the recorded line, we're sorry, all our lines are busy, please try again later. It's essentially that, but digital. And so you have some estimates on the number of attacks per day, upwards of around 10,000. The average downtime caused by these attacks is about 2.3 hours, but it's not unknown for them to span well into uh, over a day's time. And the average cost of these attacks per hour is about $40,000. Again, these are, these are averages, so you've got to, you know, there's some on the high end, there's some on the low end, but you get the point that the, the numbers are significant, and if you actually do some very rudimentary just multiplication of these averages, you end up with a figure to nearing, or at least topping, $900 million a day in terms of the damage done by bombnets. So they're a big problem. It's all digital, essentially, but they can, but they can cause some real-world costs for businesses around the world. And the, the other problem to compound all of that is that they're also really cheap to rent. And so you have another situation where someone might have malicious intent, they want to knock a competitor's website offline, for example, but they're not going to go out right now where infect a bunch of computers, make their own bot, and then target them. Instead, they'll go to a dark web website or market, and they'll rent a dark web, or they'll rent a botnet. And so Trend Micro, for example, put out in 2012 some estimates on the cost of renting these sites or these botnets, it was about $10 for an hour-long barrage. Uh, one day ranged anywhere from $30 to $70, and one week, a week-long attack was $150. So if you stack up the cost of launching these attacks versus the damage that they can do, you really see that the scale that we're dealing with is being amplified, is being amplified by the internet, by the dark web. Uh, the scale or the scope of what criminals can do is being amplified, I should say. And so, like the rest of the internet, the dark web is playing that sort of amplification role in a very interesting and troubling way. So these are some of the specific uses. There are a few others that we can get into uh, as we sort of go through this discussion, but these sort of show the point that there's a lot of nefarious uses to which the internet can be put, or the dark web, I should say, can be put. 
Now, if you back up a little bit, there's also been some efforts to try to actually look more systematically, in general terms, about the proportion of sites out on the dark web that are malicious and illegal versus legal and not so malicious. So one study by uh, DeepLight that came out earlier this year found a basically a 50-50 split when they were machine coding dark web websites, doing pull down of keywords from these sites. They found about a 50-50 split between whether they were illegal or illegal using this being based on American laws. When they did human coding for a series of these, they found a split of 32 to 68, or roughly two thirds, uh, two thirds illegal. Now the reason for that is essentially that criminals, like most people, value their privacy, but criminals, like most people, have even more costs to take uh, sophisticated steps to try to ensure that some of the easy ways to find them, which would be things like machine coding bots, can't reach them. So things as simple as a capture window would be or would differentiate the human coding from the machine coding. So likely, if you had to pick one of these and say which one was more accurate in terms of a general portion of sites that are legal versus illegal, the human coded is probably closer. So we're probably dealing with about two thirds of dark web websites that are probably illegal in their in their, in their content. Another study, and this is one of the papers that I have here with me today, was conducted by two computer scientists in, uh, in the University of Portsmouth in the UK. And what they did was essentially take 40 computers and they volunteered them into the Tor network. As I mentioned, the whole thing is volunteer-based. So they added IP addresses, they made themselves part of the system, and they began at that point to pull down keywords from sites, not content, just keywords, just pulling down content in some of these cases would be illegal. And they basically put it, started putting them into categories. And what they found was there's a wide range, obviously, of different sites out there, ranging from gambling guns, chat rooms, and news websites, through to Bitcoin fraud, market sites, and drugs. Drugs made up the largest proportion of all sites, about 15%, according to this particular uh, take at the, at the distribution. But the number that I want to draw your attention to, because it moves us into the next topic of traffic, is this one right here. The 2% of sites dedicated to child abuse. This would be child abuse imagery, viewership, distribution, production, 2%. 2%. And what they did as a second stage to their research was actually begin to track site visits. So they weren't de-anonymizing the system. They didn't know who was, was requesting this material, but they could see the sites that were being viewed. And what they were able to, to do at that point was basically start to count the site visits. So how in terms of the, the overall traffic pattern, where was everybody going? And so that, this 2% becomes important because what they found was that actually around 82, 83% of traffic went to that 2% of sites. Now they're very good at what they do and they are academic, so they were very sure to qualify this. This, this number will be inflated by law enforcement, this number will be inflated by machines that try to view these sites. There'll be a variety of ways of things inflating this number, but it's so overwhelmingly disproportionate compared to the other patterns of traffic that the main conclusion that they draw, and I think it's a supportable one, is that in terms of where people are going, on the dark web, a lot of it tends to cluster on child abuse imagery sites, which is an unfortunate and obviously terrible finding. As I mentioned earlier, Tor doesn't restrict you just to the dark web. So I can use the Tor browser at home and go not to a hidden services dark web website, but to, I could go to the RCMI website, I could go to the uh, cbc.ca, I could, I could surf the surface web using Tor, and I would be anonymous and invisible to the websites and to my ISP, they wouldn't know what I'm viewing, but I, I'd stay on the surface web. But there again, Cloudflare, which is a web services company that basically provide traffic management and security to websites uh, of various stripes. What they've done is they released results, uh, this should be 2016, not 2015, it was a couple of months ago, they released, they released these results indicating that upwards of 94% of the traffic coming to the websites that they take care of, that was coming out of the Tor network, what they found was 94% was uh, malicious. That the, the, the aim of this traffic was to essentially scrape websites and to try to find biographical information, be it names, phone numbers, or particularly email addresses that could then be used to send for, for spam email campaigns. And only 6% of the traffic that they found was not malicious. 
And so even when you're staying on the surface web, there still is a lot of ways to get up to criminal misdeed. And Cloudflare's estimates here, although disputed by the Tor project that runs the system, uh, I think do provide a sense of the fact that using the Tor browser, even if you're on the surface web, still means you're, you're, it's easy enough to get up to no good on that front. And so when you get, when you take the, 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 the sites that exist and you take the traffic patterns as they exist, both on the dark web itself and using the browser, but on the surface web, uh, and you sort of stack that all up, again, next to the, the, the numbers I showed, the point I made earlier about the fact that there are legitimate uses in some contexts, and then you ask people, what should we do about the dark web? Should we shut it down? Uh, an overwhelming number of people, 71%, say that yes, the dark web should be taken down, taken offline. So this, is, this survey, which I had a hand in, polled 24,000 people in 24 countries. So we're talking a pretty global sample. You had China, you had India, you had the US, you had a host of others. So this is a good, I think, global representation of public opinion as it exists vis-a-vis -vis the dark web. It's seen as a predominantly negative tool that should probably be shut down. As I mentioned, before, there's, there are moral problems with that. I've likened it to what I call a dark web dilemma, where if you do take that network down, people who are using it for legitimate purposes in repressive regimes are basically, you're taking their shield. And that can actually lead, in some cases, to real world physical harm for these individuals. If they continue to uh, try to engage publicly and politically without the cover of something like Tor, you could, they could actually end up in prison. So you are gonna hurt people if you just shut it down. And from a moral perspective, it's not probably a good option. From a technological perspective, you also run into issues where, like the proverbial genie, once this thing's out of the bottle, we now know how to create an anonymous network. You take Tor down, which would be possible, but there are already alternatives that exist, and people would just flock to those. So technologically infeasible, morally questionable, so you can't just shut it down. Despite public opinion, it's not a particularly viable solution. And so what I propose as an alternative is you basically deal with the fact that there is bad things going on, and you try to reduce those as much as possible, and in doing so you make the networks or the net terms a bit better. And I advocate for policing the network as the solution to that. So I'll go through four different tactics of policing that have been used quite effectively uh, before this offers a few just general conclusions. So the first is uh, a very rudimentary and basic approach, which is dark web index. Obviously, I rank this one first in the list, and I think it's a sort of prerequisite for any other type of policing, because if you don't know the crime's going on at a particular location, it's pretty well impossible to police it. And so, like that, as that applies in the physical world, it also applies in the digital world, so if you don't know where, for example, all the child abuse imagery sites are, it's really hard to try to break into them and try to gain access to membership roles and try to figure out who's doing what and, all, and rescue victims and all the rest. So one of the characteristics of the dark web is that it's not actively indexed by any of the major search engines, and part of it has to do with the way in which the, the sites themselves are hosted. So you have sort of your hand-coded or, 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 or discrete but machine-coded efforts at uh, indexing as was done by those studies that I mentioned, but they weren't creating it in a searchable way, they were creating it just so to in rough categories, which could, I guess, give you a, a leg up, but it wouldn't give you the same sort of uh, same sort of fine-grained searchability that you have with something like in the, uh, the publicly indexed, uh, in the indexed surface web. So there are efforts. Kaspersky Lab, and which is a private uh, IT security company, and Interpol, they've teamed up and together have indexed about 25,000 dark web websites. Um, of the pool of 30 to 60,000, that's actually a fair proportion. And Dar uh, DARPA, which actually well, it was the Naval Research Intelligence Lab that had a hand in creating Tor in the first place. But the American military is making what they call Memex, which is basically designed, if they can get it up and running to work right, to be the sort of Google Chrome of the dark web, which would allow law enforcement to have a pretty clear sense of what's going on in terms of the sites uh, that exist there. At least that way you can tailor resources accordingly and potentially try to target the sites that uh, are, are up to the that are offering the worst services or up to the least good. Another approach that's contentious, uh, to say the least, uh, and I'm on the outlier side here where I think it's actually okay to do, 
is technological manipulation. You could call it hacking as well. Uh, but it has been used effectively, especially by the FBI, where they basically said the technology is what's killing us here, but the technology has flaws. They might be introduced by humans, but they might be based in the code, but we can take advantage of those. And there's a uh, sort of tit-for-tat battle going on between the FBI and the Tor project, which runs, runs the Tor network and the dark web component that it hosts, where the FBI will take advantage of some defect in the code, and then the Tor project will push through a patch making the Tor network invulnerable to that particular attack in the future. And so one example of this working effectively for the FBI was when they managed to commandeer freedom hosting servers. These servers were located in Ireland, and once they got a hold of them, they were able to take advantage of a flaw in the JavaScript to actually infect everyone who visited any website on freedom hosting, uh, which hosted a, a variety of children abuse imagery sites, and they infected everyone's computer with a bit of malware. The malware didn't do anything bad, it didn't destroy the it didn't destroy data, it didn't lock people out of the system. All it did was go back to the home computer, take the Mac ID number, the IP address, and then send that information to a server in Virginia. And so essentially by hacking the websites or all that were hosted on the server, everyone that went there basically tagged themselves and then they brought that home with them and then they sent that information via this malware to the FBI, which was then able to make over 1,500 arrests uh, on uh, sites that were hosted on this particular service. Human rights advocates and privacy advocates do not like this particular tactic. They say that it's indiscriminate. I say not so much myself. Um, simply because if you hacked all the technology, sure, but this was very, it was targeted in the sense that there was a specific set of servers hosting a specific set of sites and if you went to those sites, chances are you were up to no good. And so I don't really have a moral problem with it, though some do, but it has proven here and in other instances to be an effective tactic that can be used by law enforcement in taking advantage of the technology. So another way, you, another advantage to, uh, oddly, of the anonymity of the system is that it cuts both ways. So law enforcement's problem is they don't know who the criminals are. And the criminal's problem is they don't know who out there that they're corresponding with happens to be law enforcement. And sometimes, just like in the real world, undercover operations can be quite effective at actually compounding, if not identifying, criminals that exist. So Silk Road 1.0 uh, is, a, is a good case example of this, where the Dread Pirate Roberts, whose real name was Ross Ulbrich, he essentially, once they started to unravel site administrators to pinpoint who was doing what was still safe. But he began to compound all of his legal problems because he ended up offering the FBI, I think it was $80,000 to have a former site administrator who had turned state's evidence murdered. And, and so, but because the investigation was ongoing, the FBI, they staged the killing, they showed him the pictures, he made payment, compounded his legal problems obviously, but the person that he'd been talking to was the FBI that they, he did not realize that basically the anonymity provided by the system as a function of its very existence had basically screwed it for lack of a better term. So there, that's another way. You don't have to give up on the sort of fact that it's humans interaction with, interacting with humans at one level and there's ways to manipulate that. There's ways to come get around the fact that the technology is uh, an interesting shield or an effective shield in a lot of instances and you can still get at criminals. And finally, and this is a newer sort of track that law enforcement is taking, there's this sort of notion that it's all still one big network. So there probably isn't a single person out there who only does work or all their activity on the dark web. The people who are on the dark web are also going to pop onto the surface web and they're going to do things. They're going to sign into the news, they're going to sign on to Reddit, they're going to, and they're going to post in chat rooms and all the rest. And if you look at it that way, you can actually start to draw links between people who and what they disclosed publicly on the surface web and what they actually did, which was illegal, on the dark web. And so this Reddit R darknet markets instance is essentially people who on the Reddit forum, which is a big chat forum with videos and pictures and all the rest, uh, were disclosing the, their use, purchase, sale, and all the rest of dark web illegal markets that were dedicated towards drugs, evolution being one of the main ones. 
And essentially, the I think it was Homeland Security got wise to the fact that these people were publicly saying, essentially, look at us commit crimes on the dark web, and basically started issuing subpoenas. Because while people feel like they're anonymous on the dark web, they're actually not. Or sorry, I feel like they're anonymous on Reddit, they're actually not. And so Reddit had was under no legal obligation to try to protect these individuals, and so they just turned over their contact information to law enforcement, which led to a series of what I'm assuming are very awkward conversations with, uh, with federal officials. And so viewing it this way, you can get, you know, there's other examples I can go through, one of which uh, someone, was because of some uh, child abuser in Australia was actually caught because of his posts on a 4x4 truck form where they pinpointed the geographic area that he lived and because of the things that he was saying, and in particular, his greeting, which was, he assigned into everything that he wrote as Hyas, H-I-Y-A-S, because it was such a unique greeting, they were able to say, this guy is likely the same one as the one posting in these dark web child abuse forums, and they were able then to pinpoint uh, his job at a child care facility, giving him access to children, and then they were able to unfurl it from there. So small things like that, and recognizing that we're human, we, we're, and we're using all of it at, at the same time, can give law enforcement a bit of a leg up. So those are just four tactics. There are others we can talk about, but those ones are effective and have proven themselves effective despite the anonymity that Tor provides. So just by way of a few conclusions here, I think one point to take away is that we're still dealing with, we're dealing with a problem, but it's still small. That across every measure, the dark web is minuscule when you compare it to the surface web, and the magnitude of problem, of trouble you can get in may be larger, but the the proportion of people actually using it is still relatively small. 2.5 million users a day is tiny compared to the global uh, traffic flows that you actually have. The problem, of course, is that due to, uh, thing, due to revelations about NSA surveillance and other trends, that number, those numbers are growing. And as they get bigger, the network becomes harder to police because there's just more noise for the signal that you're trying to look for. Another conclusion is obviously, as I think some of the sites indicate quite well, you have seen a shift. That criminals overall, they've shifted online. Uh, and in particular, criminals are starting to increasingly shift towards the dark web, simply because why not use a readily accessible and easily, uh, and easily quite functional tool to, if you can, and if it's going to provide you with some degree of protection. There's no point in avoiding it, and criminals are getting wise to that uh, by the dozen. And so finally, I'll, and I'll conclude with this particular thought. I would reiterate again that I don't think shutting it down is a viable alternative, although public opinion, especially in the US, might swing in that direction. Uh, and I don't think so. I don't think you can shut it down, as I said, because it will harm people who do need it for legitimate purposes, and because it'll just basically turn into a giant game of whack-a-mole uh, that, that ultimately will prove to be a waste of resources and effective. But at the same time, as I like to think I pointed out, you can release it, and you can do so effectively, and in so doing, you basically reduce those harms that we've talked about today, making the network a better place overall for everybody. So I'll conclude with that, and just thank you all very much for your time. Eric, that was a most excellent presentation, but kind of disturbing. What we'll do is we'll take some uh, questions now, and I would ask that uh, if you have a question, to go over to the, uh, the remote mic there. Uh, identify yourself, please, and uh, just uh, put your question. Let's say, ask a question, please, and, uh, and we'll get some answers from, uh, from Dr. Eric. Thank you. Hello, Mark Baker here. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, can you use big data, essentially, in some of the major databases, especially criminal databases, to deal with uh, some of the uh, people on the dark web, maybe uh, doing some sort of relationship in terms of the way people act and behave uh, in the, on the web, as, as well as they say do in normal life, and use the data to start to find people, uh, as opposed to, say, just having lucky out where someone uses the same you know, name on, on two different websites. I would say that you absolutely could. That those sorts of, the, 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 the power of big data is still being explored. 
we're not really sure. It has a lot of promise, but we're not really sure just how much you're going to be able to learn. But to veer us sideways for a second before I come back to, to your particular question, I read one study that was able to pinpoint with, I believe, 95% degree, 95 accuracy the uh, identity of a person from four, uh, uh, from four, from, by knowing four mobile apps on their phone, they were able to pinpoint with 95% accuracy who the person was. And so it's an example of big data in action and as it pertains to people's identities. And I think you will be able to begin, and again, the jury's still out on how effective big data will turn out to be, but I think you will be able to move in that direction of drawing those correlations. The problem will be getting enough data on the dark website. Because to get that information to start to draw those correlations, you need to have access to the sites. You need to be able to start to put together a list of these are the people that we want. So I think for the short run, it'll remain piecemeal, as these the two examples I brought up are. But I think over the longer term, especially if you can get things like Memex up and running and to be able to actually search these sites more comprehensively, then it will start to be able be easier to draw correlations for sure. Thank you very much. from my own information and I think others in the room. I've got a laptop at home and I've got a wife with all sorts of hardware connected to the office. How much is it going to cost me a month to have some guru wipe it all clean on a regular basis to make sure I'm not being used? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would say prevention is probably your best bet. There's And there's interesting numbers out there about just how effective a little bit of prevention can actually be. So there, in 2009, before a Senate committee hearing, uh, I forget, one of the federal agencies, maybe the NSA, actually came out and said, if you, if you just configure all your stuff right, you'll block 80% of attacks. But there's another study by uh, Verizon that came out in 2015 that said, if you updated all the patches on your computer, so you get those annoying bubbles that says, please update Adobe, please update whatever, those are often important because they're often linked to uh, security vulnerabilities that the company has found and they're pushing through a patch to try to make you safer. So they're annoying to do, but they actually keep you safe. But the problem is this one study by Verizon found that 99% of uh, exploits that were undertaken during that year actually used a vulnerability that had already had a patch published for it. So they're basically taking advantage of people who had not yet patched their systems. And so basic steps of prevention like that are probably better than paying someone to wipe it clean, but at a certain point you might need to do that. But I'm not, there's probably security experts in the room who are more on the, the dollar figure side of things, but I would just say, yeah, a little digital hygiene goes a long way. Jim Edwards. Uh, Dr. Jardine, I listened to a TED talk recently that suggests the dark net does have significant commercial opportunities in the future. Um, and it's not just this nefarious, it is now, but it may not be in future, just this nefarious underworld. Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, I think the potential is there. Uh, and you do see, for example, uh, I showed the Facebook example, there's Propydia, Media, and Wired. You've seen a shift of some companies onto the dark web. Uh, most of them are, most of them have an information role to play, be it a news site or a whistleblower site or a social media site. And those are going to be the first ones to move. The, where I think the commercialization of the dark web is going to run into some issues is that by design, the system lacks a lot of the functions that you'd see on the surface web. And that is actually annoying for some users and, and stymies some of the efforts, uh, probably will stymie some of the efforts at commercialization. Because they basically have stripped out things like JavaScript and stuff like that from some of the browsers. Because they basically recognize just the more computer programs you overlay, the more plugins, the more vulnerabilities you're introducing, and the weaker the anonymity of the system. So it not, doesn't mean it's impossible to commercialize it, it just means that some of the, the some of the sites that require sort of a lot of whiz bangs, for lack of a better term, to be part and parcel of the website are going to have a hard time making that transition transition just because the system the network itself is designed 
to exclude all of those on purpose. Patrick Graham, I, can you just give a quick potted history of how it started, like what Tor is and just the origins of it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Tor is run by the Tor Project, which is an incorporated not-for-profit in the United States. So their main funder at this point in time, as it has been since 1990 when I believe the code went public, is the US government, oddly. The origins of the code itself is actually naval research labs. So they, the US government made the technology and then essentially released it to the public. The sort of political economy of that choice is still a little murky. Uh, my basic understanding of it was the was twofold. The US military, which designed it, wanted to use it for, for, for communication purposes, and they recognized that if only the military was using it for communication purposes, it basically makes it very easy for enemies to be like, this is the military, we need to target any signal of that sort. And so they tried to just throw a bunch of hay in with the needle by making it public. And then you have now, the, the State Department has jumped on the bandwagon because they recognize it as a very useful tool for uh, human rights activists and, and freedom fighters around the world. And so they provide the funds to the TOR project for, under the idea that it helps spread democracy and human rights, which is part of their sort of internet freedom agenda. So while I, when I mentioned the uh, earlier about public opinion saying maybe shut it down, in the US, like elsewhere, majority still say shut it down, and the U.S. would be the one jurisdiction, if you wanted to railroad the dark web in the short term, they'd be the jurisdiction that could do it, because they provide the funds to the TOR project, and because it's incorporated in their territory. But the problem there is, it still would be difficult to do, because all the computers are hosted globally. So you sort of have this weird interplay of international politics, you have the interplay of military uh, operations, you have the interplay of of uh, human rights activists and just government bureaucracies and sort of path dependency, we've always funded them, so why not keep funding them? All these sorts of things all coming together to create a technology that really does cut it in two different ways. Tom Dallas, notwithstanding we don't know who the criminals using Tor are, is there a sense of how it's spread internationally, statistically, or a guesstimate? And I'm wondering, with respect to policing, are there any special laws required to actually uh, police it effectively and then obviously identify and capture people? Or is it just subject to whatever country and international laws we have now? So in terms of its, its spread and usage, it, uh, I think it was around 2009 where Tor started to really take off. It, uh, if my recollection is not failing me, it began after a series of media articles covered it. So it's sort of a public interest thing that people thought, hey, this kind of would be neat to try. And they tried it, and it sort of snowballed from there. There are alternatives to Tor. There's I2P and a couple of others. But they, their usage rates are nowhere close to what Tor has. And it's spread because, I think, because of that idea that the more noise, the harder to find the signal, that once everybody's on Tor, everyone's decided to go on Tor. And so you have, had, you have seen a pretty uh, interesting global pattern uh, of spread where Latin America seems to be the laggard overall or, uh, compared uh, to North America, Europe, or uh, Africa or Asian countries. Latin America seems lower for some reason. Uh, but you, and you will have uh, had laid on to that events like Snowden's disclosures that have just caused massive spikes. So I have in a, a book that I'm just finishing now uh, a, a chart, which I wish I had with me because much more visual than me going like this. But it basically, you have a, almost a flat line in terms of Tor usage leading up to 2013, from, from, 20, from 2011 to 2013. Then three months after the disclosures, it jumped just like in a gigantic spike. Uh, and it's basically because word got out that this was a technology that could be used to stop and prevent the NSA from doing what it was doing. And so most of the growth in usage uh, most of it is probably relatively benign. It's probably just people signing in once and the numbers get inflated. They're not really doing anything. Because as I said, the functionality of the system is not great. It's slower. You can't really stream videos from the websites, things like that. But you have seen sort of a global spread. In terms of your second question about what do you do 
in terms of the process of actually trying to get the kernels and arrest them and all the rest, you run right then smack into what are known as mutual legal assistance treaties, or MLATs, which are basically, they're designed for another age, but they're the, the only rules we have in the books at this point to basically allow one jurisdiction to say, this person's broken the law, we'd like to use this treaty to get that person apprehended and all the rest. And the problem with them is that it takes months to fill, if you fill them correctly. Institutionally, no one has an incentive to fight crime in another jurisdiction. And so you tend to have uh, the sort of MLAT requests get pushed to the bottom of the pile. But right now, they're sort of what is on the books in, in terms of official avenues of collaboration. And that means that Russia or Eastern Europe, where a lot of botnet activity comes from, actually becomes almost a safe haven because Russia is essentially saying we're not going to ever go after cyber criminals as long in our jurisdiction. Sorry, the Western world. And so cyber criminals are almost safe there because their only avenue of recourse is are these MLATs. Now, there is sort of a workaround, which is essentially just ad hoc, uh, ad hoc engagements and coalitions. And you see this uh, emerging quite a bit, where between law enforcement and often now uh, between law enforcement and private security companies, and not private security companies in like the Blackwater sense, but private security companies in like the IT sense. So Symantec or Kaspersky Labs or even Microsoft, and they'll team up because the, the technology is understood and often owned by firms and law enforcement has the legal authority to make arrests so they'll team up across borders and you'll see countries like Canada and the US teaming up with European countries and Europol to try to uh, to try to make these arrests across borders and as long as everyone's playing by the same set of rules which happens among a small group you can you can get some traction but the MLAT process itself which is the sort of global expanding version of policing across borders is pretty broken when it comes to trying to police cyber crime because it's just too slow and too efficient. This has been another in the ongoing series of podcasts brought to you as an educational service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. You can keep abreast of our web offerings as well as our live events by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. Once again, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for being with us and good night.